Awakening to an unfamiliar setting devoid of civilization's comforting presence, four young girls find themselves lost and disoriented on a remote island. As they gather their senses, a mixture of apprehension and curiosity fills the air, prompting them to introduce themselves. As the group's attention falls upon Anishima Homer, she blankly reveals that it is not her first time being stranded. The jerry realization of being stranded and alone finally dawns upon the girls, shattering the silence that once enveloped them. Twenty hours before Homer regained her consciousness, she recalls how her father told her to face the opponent with determination, how she should never eat slugs raw and how moose testicles are a rare and valuable cut of meat that can be eaten raw, but the taste might be not exactly flavorsome. A mere twenty hours before Homer's consciousness is restored, fragmented memories of her father resurface in her mind, urging her to confront her enemies with unyielding determination, a lesson etched deep within her core. In the haze of recollection, she recalls an odd yet memorable warning from him, cautioning her never to consume slugs in their raw form, a peculiar admonition that now holds newfound significance. In the same flow of memories, she recollects how her father described moose testicles as a rare and coveted delicacy, edible even in their raw state, though the flavor may not be entirely appetizing. The latter proves to be true as a young Homer scrunches her nose in disgust after sampling the rare and highly prized moose testes. Upon finally waking up, Homer finds herself surrounded by Mutsu, Cheyenne, and Asuka. Dying of thirst, Cheyenne asks the girls how long they must wait for the rescue team to arrive. Before Ashuka can guide Cheyenne towards the nearby ocean, Homer interjects and explains that they cannot consume seawater. Curious to understand the rationale behind Homer's caution, Ashuka asks the reason for not drinking seawater. Homer explains that if they drink seawater, the salt in the water would drain their bodies of moisture leading to severe problems. They would start experiencing intense headaches, nausea, and organ failure, which would eventually lead them to a very painful demise. A collective shudder passes through the girls as they absorb the weight of Homer's words. Seizing the opportunity presented by a passing flying fish, Homer springs into action. After capturing the fish, Homer wraps the lifeless creature in her uniform shirt and begins the process of consuming the fish's blood. She explains to her audience that it's crucial to drink the bodily fluids first, extracting the moisture from the organs and blood before consuming solid food. As time passes by, Homer's sharp institution leads her to the realization that land must be within reach. Her assumption gains further support by Mutsu, who calculates the distance using the Pythagorean theorem. Asuka enthusiastically states that she expected Mutsu to be a genius since she's wearing spectacles. Unable to take it anymore, Cheyenne cries in irritation that she needs water. Upon noticing Cheyenne's increasing distress, Homer instructs her to close her eyes, lie down, and open her mouth. Asuka stares in horror as Homer takes off her undergarments and reveals that when it's fresh, it's sterile. With fortune smiling on Cheyenne, Homer ends up missing her mark. Once the sun begins to set, the girls grow wary. Asuka glumly expresses how they could have been resting comfortably in their hotel rooms if the trip had gone according to plan. Determined to forge a path forward, the girls decide to swim towards the distant island. As the plan sets in motion, the girls notice a shark swimming towards them. Homer saves the day by electrocuting the shark with her old battery phone. Upon reaching the shore, Asuka asks Homer about the places she has been stranded in. Homer reveals that she has been stranded in the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Ocean. After learning that, Asuka asks her about their next move. Before Homer could finish her sentence, Matsu ends up collapsing due to dehydration. After carrying Matsu to the shade, Homer instructs the group to find water bottles. She then states that they can collect water from plants by cutting the bamboo and vines, but since that takes more time, they can purify undrinkable water or distill seawater, but as they don't have the resources for that, they must locate a spring. Upon noticing Matsu's state, Homer tells her to collect her spit in her mouth and breathe through the nose. When Matsu cries that she doesn't have any spit, Homer locks her lips with Matsu's. After a hot minute, the two break apart. To Matsu's dismay, she discovers a locust leg lingering in her mouth. Matsu awkwardly says that her first kiss tasted like locust. Driven by the primal instinct for survival and thirst, Asuka and Homer venture into the dense verdant forest of the island. In the meantime, Cheyenne voices her frustration to Mutsu, expressing her dissatisfaction about the need to scavenge for water bottles. She ends up confessing to Mutsu about how she doesn't completely trust Homer. In opposition to Cheyenne's lingering mistrust, Mutsu gently reminds her of the time when Homer bravely saved them from the shark. While reflecting on this heroic act, Mutsu emphasizes that Homer has proven herself to be reliable and dependable. Cheyenne pouts and boldly claims that she is more reliable than Homer. Eager to prove herself, she instructs Mutsu to wait as she sets out to find something for her to lie upon. In the heart of the forest, Asuka's breath grows tired from a long walk. Pausing to catch her breath, she urges Homer to take a moment and rest. However, to her surprise, Homer responds with a blank expression, calmly assuring Asuka that she is fine and doesn't require any company or assistance. Known for her athleticism, Asuka finds herself growing increasingly frustrated by Homer's response. With a sigh of defeat, Asuka advises Homer to be a bit more approachable, suggesting that she use her name instead of calling her as you. Unswayed by Asuka's plea, Homer's attention shifts towards a sawfly. 
While observing its presence keenly, Homer recalls how sawflies typically remain close to their nests. A glimmer of hope sparks within her as she realizes that they must be close to water. As Homer resumes her march forward, a fatigued Asuka follows close behind. Back on the sandy shores of the beach, Cheyenne's eyes light up with delight as she discovers a coconut. With a sense of accomplishment, she excitedly presents it to Matsu, proudly stating that it can be used as a makeshift pillow. However, Matsu reminds her that what she is holding is indeed a coconut, not a suitable pillow. Cheyenne gazes at the coconut in her hands. Memories of a past experience flood her mind as she reminisces about a time when she had a coconut during her visit to Hawaii. After that nostalgic trip, Cheyenne enthusiastically tells Mutsu that they can drink coconut water. With a beaming smile, she brings the coconut closer to Mutsu. Her eyes fill with anticipation, eagerly awaiting Mutsu's praise. Mutsu grasps on quickly and compliments Shine for being a huge help. Overwhelmed by exhaustion, Asuka reaches her breaking point. Upon inspection the damp ground, Homer suggests that they start digging, explaining that water often flows beneath riverbeds. Though as Asuka's strength wanes, she begins to think of the possibility that this may be the end for her. Fueled by her concern for Asuka, Homer digs relentlessly until she uncovers damp soil. With a desperate hope, she manages to extract a few precious drops of water, offering them to a parched and weakened Asuka. As Asuka's strength slowly returns, she expresses her concern for Homer, insisting that it's now her turn to drink. In response, Homer assures Asuka that she can continue drinking from her sock, as she has another one available. Upon realizing that she had been eagerly consuming water from Homer's sock, a mixture of shock and disgust washes over Asuka. Meanwhile, Cheyenne finds her hopes crushed after finding the coconut dry. Driven by her concern for Matsu, Cheyenne implores Matsu to consider drinking her urine, as she wants her to live on. Fortune smiles upon them as rain starts to pour. After refreshing her parched throats, Honer tells the girls three vital rules of survival. First, she emphasizes on the importance of maintaining a normal body temperature, as any deviation could lead to death within three hours. Secondly, Homer highlights the significance of water, stating that without water one will die within three days. Lastly, she explains that without food, a person will die within three weeks. Due to the intense hunger, the girls completely ignore Homer's lesson and complain about their empty bellies. Once again, Homer rises to action by collecting sea urchin, seaweed, bugs, and a mysterious jar. As Cheyenne and Matsu place dibs on the sea urchin and seaweed, Asuka reluctantly takes the jar with rotten jam but ends up throwing up. Homer, on the other hand, enjoys her cicada and instantly falls asleep. As Asuka gulps down water, she apprehensively thinks about the absent rescue team. She casts a glance towards Homer, who diligently engages herself in the constructing of a shelter. A wave of gratitude washes over Asuka as she realizes that they're all safe and sound because of Homer's resourcefulness. Asuka's chain of thoughts is abruptly interrupted by the rumbling of her hungry stomach. Expressing her hunger, Asuka begs Homer to acknowledge their need for sustenance. However, Homer, ever so focused on their priorities, reminds Asuka that they have yet to complete the construction of their shelter. Asuka takes notice of the recurring coldness in Homer's demeanor, yet she thinks about how Homer swiftly scavenged food for the group upon her hungry outburst. Employing the same tactics, Asuka begins to whine about being hungry when Shan and Watsu coldly look down at her and ask her why she's slacking. Asuka whines and tells the girls to not look down on her. Their brief conversation is interrupted by Homer, who states that she needs vines for the roof. Asuka springs to her feet, volunteering to gather vines for the shelter. Asuka, accompanied by Homer, eagerly begins to dig up plants with hopes of uncovering a taro. Homer's face contorts into a grimace as she cautions Asuka to avoid consuming anything she's unsure about. As Asuka begins to whine, Homer sighs and says that they can do a patch test before consuming the plant. A patch test, in other words, is an edibility test where one applies a cut on the surface of the skin to observe the reaction. Agreeing to do a patch test, Asuka bends over to let Homer conduct the test on her butt. All of a sudden, Asuka expresses how she's feeling tamely and numb. Upon inspecting the area, Honer sternly says that the plant contains poison. The hunger and fatigue forces Asuka to lie down on the ground while Homer is left to toil alone. Asuka sees a cicada land on her hand, which she quickly captures. While trying to eat it, Asuka chickens out and lets the bug loose. Honer catches the bug in midair and pops his head like a can opener. In the meantime, Cheyenne's mind wanders to her beloved family and her faithful pet dog, Arnold. In her musings, Cheyenne imagines her family's disbelief if they witness her sipping rainwater. As the girls relax in their newly made shelter, Cheyenne runs to them and states they need a shower because she can't have the rescue team thinking that she stinks. While Matsu and Asuka stare at Cheyenne in bewilderment, Homer agrees to give Shan's request to go. With remarkable speed and resourcefulness, Homer utilizes her ingenuity to create a makeshift shower. As the shower takes shape before their eyes, Cheyenne initially regards it with a mix of weariness and anxiety. The idea of being naked in the open air triggers a sense of vulnerability within her. However, curiosity and a touch of adventurous spirit prevail as Shin decides to give it a try. As the water washes over her, Shine's worries quickly fade away. 
While procuring food with home air, Matsu looks at her with admiration. She thinks about how everything she learned in school is useless on the island. Lucky for her, home air is there to teach her. As the girls fetch food from the seaside, Matsu apologizes to the hermit crabs before watching Homer viciously devour them. Upon returning, Homer creates a fire using the bottle as a convex lens. She adds dried leaves to serve as a fire starter and voila, they have themselves a warm, yummy cooked meal. Nestled by the fire, Homer takes the opportunity to teach the girls about the art of devouring a hermit crab. As Homer casually tosses the crab inside her mouth, Cheyenne ends up having a breakdown at the sight. Matsu, on the other hand, steps forward to give the peculiar delicacy a go. Matsu's words prompt Cheyenne and Asuka to have a bigger heart towards the hermit crab. Being the one with a bigger appetite, Asuka complains about the small size of the hermit crab. In response to her complaints, Homer says that they're going to hunt animals now. Surprised by Homer's plan, Asuka asks her to elaborate. Homer then reveals that while walking on the beach, she stumbled upon the footprints of squirrels. As Homer tells about her plan to devour squirrel meat, Matsu's world begins to darken. When the girls inquire about the traps that will aid them in hunting for the squirrels, Homer's mind swiftly goes back to the valuable teachings from her father's survival training. With a sense of determination, she explains that there are four distinct types of primitive traps specifically designed for hunting and capturing animals. The first is the classical snare which effectively kills the prey by strangulation. The second trap Homer introduces is the deadly yet efficient spear, designed to swiftly dispatch the creature through a piercing stab. The third trap is the deadfall, which cleverly utilizes weight to incapacitate and eliminate the animal. Lastly, she explains the pitfall trap, where prey is lured and trapped within a concealed hole. Unfortunately, the girls don't share Homer's excitement and her plans to unleash brutality on innocent animals. Yet understanding their situation, they all set out to make traps expect for Shein. Feeling annoyed by Shine's reluctance to participate, Asuka complains to Matsu about how Shine always wants to be babied. While trying to find a wire for the snare, Asuka discovers a toad. Homer congratulates her on her find and informs Asuka that since toads are poisonous, she should peel the skin before consuming it. As Asuka apprehensively approaches the toad, Homer tells her to be careful as the creature contains poisonous glands behind its ears. Later on, Matsu, Asuka, and Homer venture in the forest to gather some water. There, they stumble upon a burrow. Homer picks up animal droppings to examine it. After inspecting it, she determines that the poop belongs to a rabbit. Honer tells the girls that they'll set traps for squirrels and rabbits. After reuniting with Cheyenne, Matsu eagerly shares the news of Asuka's attempted catch, a toad. However, when the attention turns to Asuka, she sheepishly admits that the toad managed to escape her grasp. Although Asuka may have fooled Homer with her explanation, Matsu smiles knowingly. As Homer and Asuka go through the scavenged pile of trash, Asuka asks Homer if they'll be able to catch the rabbit. Homer replies to her by telling her that the rabbit is of European breed and they'll catch it when it goes in or out of the burrow. The plan sets into motion as Homer skillfully sets up the snare. With excitement in her voice, Asuka fantasizes about the taste of rabbit meat. However, Matsu's disapproval on the topic becomes apparent as she reminds Asuka about how she let the toad free. Asuka explains to her that it's a different case when it comes to rabbits, as her body craves meat. Homer then tells the girls to keep it down as rabbits have exceptionally well hearing. Her face darkens with seriousness as she tells Matsu to be vigilant while placing the traps. Matsu and Asuka team up to set the trap. Unable to find a branch, Matsu improvises and comes up with an efficient way to place the trap. Drained of energy, Cheyenne wearily approaches Asuka, Homer, and Matsu, seeking information about their dinner plans. Homer, feeling a sense of unease, hurriedly assures Cheyenne that she will find something for them to eat. Growing exhausted from the same meals, Cheyenne complains to her about the lack of variety. In response, Homer quickly tells Cheyenne that she will find something different for them. Cheyenne's ears instantly perk up when Homer mentions getting turban shells for the meal. Asuka, walking alongside Homer, observes a rare sight, Homer appearing flustered for the first time. As they arrive on the shore, Homer directs Asuka towards the deeper part of the ocean. With purpose in her voice, she explains that to obtain larger shellfish, such as turban shells, they must dive beneath the surface. Asuka's heart pounds with fear as she finds herself enveloped by the darkness of the ocean. She glances at Homer, gracefully swimming and wonders if she'll be okay. In the meantime, Homer recalls how her father taught her to use the air in her lungs to improvise underwater glasses. After some time, Cheyenne excitedly approaches Homer, who releases a handful of starfish onto the ground. A wave of devastation crashes over Cheyenne as she sees no sign of turban shells. Later on, as Homer cooks up the starfish, Cheyenne tries to convince herself that she's going to be eating a new kind of turban shell. As Homer extends the starfish to Cheyenne, her keen eye notices the scars adorning Homer's hands. Asuka whispers into her ear, revealing that Homer had bravely attempted to retrieve oysters, but the sharp edges of the shells left their mark on her hands. With newfound appreciation for Homer's unwavering determination, Cheyenne graciously accepts the starfish and expresses her gratitude for Homer's relentless efforts. 
After their meal, Homer, Asuka, and Mutsu venture into the forest to check on the trap. Curiosity fills Asuka's voice as she asks Homer about the fate of any potential rabbits caught in the trap. With her knowledge of survival techniques, Homer explains that if the animal is still alive upon capture, then they must swiftly stretch the neck, snapping the cervical vertebrae to ensure a swift end. Asuka's eyes widen upon learning about the rabbit's fate. The girl's attention is suddenly drawn at the sight of smoke in the distance. Filled with a mix of hope and anticipation, they sprint towards it. As they reach the source of the smoke, they find Cheyenne. Anxious and eager, they ask her if she saw a rescue ship approaching. However, instead of answering, Cheyenne's face crumples and tears stream down her cheeks. She reveals that she had thought she spotted a ship, but her hopes were shattered upon closer inspection. As Matsu tries to console Cheyenne, Asuka's tough act ends up crumbling, making her latch onto Homer. After the weeping session, the girls end up falling asleep. Homer recalls her father's wise words of making barbecue in the face of misery. With that thought, she wakes Shin up and tells her to start digging. Thinking that she's in trouble, she apologizes to Homer who tells her to just dig. After acting upon the instructions, Shin discovers a wrasse. Homer praises her and reveals that she suspected earlier that they'll find Ras sleeping in the sand. Together, they collect a bunch of Ras. As Homer states that they'll have a barbecue tonight, Cheyenne returns to her happy self and thanks Homer once again. As promised, the girls end up having a Barbie party. The long-awaited day finally arrives, bringing a bittersweet moment for Asuka and Matsu as they discover a rabbit caught in a trap. The reality dawns upon them that they face the daunting task of ending the animal's life in order to sustain their own. Despite Matsu's valiant attempts, tears well up in her eyes as she struggles to carry out the task of ending the rabbit's life. Witnessing her distress, Asuka reaches out and places a comforting hand on Matsu's shoulder. Before delivering a fatal blow on the rabbit, Asuka confesses that she too finds it challenging to take a life. Beaming with pride, the girls proudly showcase their accomplishment to Homer and Cheyenne. Homer, quick to acknowledge their achievement, showers them with well-deserved praises. However, she stresses on the urgency of retrieving and preserving the animal's organs due to decomposition. With determination gleaming in her eyes, Homer sets a new goal, the creation of a stone knife. Homer begins to explain the process of crafting a stone knife. She clarifies that they need to select two stones that, when struck together, produce the loudest noise. Through this repeated striking, the stones will gradually develop sharper edges suitable for cutting. Surprisingly, Cheyenne manages to create the best stone knife out of a lot. Overwhelmed with a sense of remorse for her previous struggle, Matsu steps forward, offering to take on the task of breaking apart the rabbit carcass. Sensing Matsu's earnest desire to contribute, Homer reassures her by explaining to her that rabbits, being mammals, are relatively easy to dismantle. Under Homer's expert guidance, Matsu takes on the process of skinning the rabbit. With focused determination, she carefully removes the skin, revealing the creature's underlying flesh. As the task unfolds, Cheyenne and Asuka take cover behind a huge rock to shield themselves from the horror show. After a while, Matsu cries in excitement upon successfully skinning the rabbit. As the girls ponder over how to prepare and consume the rabbit, a moment of inspiration strikes Shane. With a glint of excitement in her eyes, she shares her experience of having hair during her time in France, suggesting that they create a French-inspired dish with the rabbit meat. However, when she's reminded that they only have rabbit meat, salt from the saltwater, and leopard plant stems, Cheyenne enthusiastically states that they can figure out a way if they set their mind into it. In a sudden burst of inspiration, Homer presents a potential solution for smoking the rabbit. Excitement fiddles the air as she instructs the girls to carefully cut the meat from the backbone and divide it into halves. The next step is to skillfully remove the bones from each piece. As Matsu diligently carries out Homer's instructions, a comment from Cheyenne about the lack of elegance in her work sends Matsu spiraling into frustration and agitation. Homer proceeds with her instructions, guiding the girls on the process of smoking the rabbit. They begin by digging a pit, which will serve as the foundation for their smoking method. Hot stones are placed at the bottom of the pit, and then covered with a layer of sand. Adorning the pit with leaves creates a natural insulating layer. Next, the girls prepare the rabbit meat by wrapping it in leopard plant leaves. With the preparations complete, Homer announces that it's time to ignite a fire on top of the pit. While waiting for the rabbit to absorb the smoke for an hour, Matsu announces that they should make soup out of the bones in the meantime. Homer's resourcefulness once again saves the day as the girls gush over the tenderness of the meat. In the blissful moment, they all cry happily about how much they love meat. After gathering the girls together, Homer addresses the group with a serious yet determined tone. With no sign of the rescue team in sight, she announces that they should shift their focus on exploring the island further. Homer emphasizes the need to find a better campsite, one that can withstand fall and winters. As Matsu and Asuka eagerly volunteer to accompany Homer on the exploration, Homer curtly tells them that she only needs the assistance of one person. Asuka seizes the opportunity and asks Homer who she can rely on more. Feeling excluded, Cheyenne offers her help. Her sudden display of confidence leaves Matsu and Asuka surprised. The girls put Homer in an awkward position by asking her to choose her partner for the expedition. In the end, 
Homer chooses Mutsu as her expedition partner, leaving Cheyenne and Asuka somewhat dejected. While cruising around the beach, Homer comes across a beach silver stop. She hands it to Mutsu and tells her that it can be eaten raw. As the girls ponder upon the island's distance from Japan, Mutsu chimes in by saying that she discovered items with English and Chinese labels but mostly bearing Japanese labels. Homer remarks that if the island is indeed close to Japan, they could simply swim back. In response, Mutsu gives her a nervous chuckle. Upon resuming their walk, the girls discover an abandoned dock. Hope begins to flutter in their hearts as they think about the possibility of having other humans on the island. While camping near the dock, Mutsu seizes the opportunity to inquire about Homer's decision to choose her as a companion. Homer explains that she selected Mutsu due to her ability to adapt swiftly. She further praises Mutsu's survival mindset, which makes her blush. Their thoughts naturally drift towards Asuka and Cheyenne, contemplating the potential dangers they might be in. This sudden realization sends Homer into panic mode. All of a sudden, Asuka and Cheyenne waltz out from the forest, stating that they coincidentally ended up finding them. With everyone gathered, Homer creates a roof by making use of tree branches. Using her father's lessons, Homer makes a first bivouac. The next morning, the girls wake up to a tasty delicacy crabs. Matsu fills in Cheyenne and Asuka about the possibility of discovering other human beings on the island. With breakfast completed, Homer devises an exploration strategy for the girls to fan out safely without getting lost. After reuniting, Cheyenne excitedly shares the news of discovering a house nestled within the forest. With curiosity piqued, the girls eagerly follow Cheyenne's lead into the woods. However, their expectations are swiftly shattered as Cheyenne reveals a dilapidated and broken-down hut. Unfazed by the reality of its condition, Cheyenne optimistically suggests that the residents must have temporarily stepped out, leaving the house unattended. With her sharp instincts at play, Homer praises Cheyenne for finding the hut. During her investigation of the hut, Homer discovers a pair of broken metallic scissors. With a glimmer of excitement in her eyes, Homer delicately examines the edges of the scissors, appreciating the unique shape and potential. Instantly putting her skills and ingenuity to use, Homer transforms the broken scissors into a functional knife. As she completes her latest creation, Homer enthusiastically shares the multiple benefits that the knife has to offer. While scanning the island, Homer's eyes suddenly widen as she notices smoke in the distance. In their eagerness, the girls swiftly make their way towards the source of the smoke, hoping to find a sign of civilization. However, their hopes are quickly dashed as they discover that the smoke emanates not from a human settlement but from a natural hot spring. All of a sudden, Mutsu points out that the rocks have been purposefully arranged, resembling the layout of an onsen. As Homer tries to analyze the situation, Asuka and Cheyenne stop her midway and remind her of urgent matters at hand. With excitement, the girls swiftly shed their clothes and eagerly welcome the comforting embrace of the hot spring. Overcome with relief and happiness, Mutsu lets out a contented sigh as she takes in the comfort of the hot water. Feeling creative, Cheyenne suggests turning the hot spring into a use bath party. Homer shares her knowledge on the citrus fruit by telling the girls that the peels contain a component called limonene, which helps improve the immune system and even provides moisture to the skin. However, when Homer sees the girls enjoying themselves, she gives up on the idea of educating them. Seconds later, Homer tells Cheyenne about the lines dividing the moon. As the group gazes up at the night sky, Homer explains how they can locate the North Star by using the constellations Cassiopeia and the Big Dipper as guides. The mention of stars immediately captivates Mutsu's interest, and she eagerly shares her own love for the celestial wonders. Enthusiastically, Mutsu begins to educate Homer about the North Star, sharing fascinating details. She mentions that the North Star, also known as Polaris, is located approximately 430 light years away from Earth and resides in the constellation Ursa Minor, also referred to as the Little Bear. Ignoring the crashing sounds of the seawater within the hot spring, Matsu continues to delve into her passion for astronomy. Within seconds, the girls find themselves buck naked but contended on the seashore. As the new day dawns, Homer gathers the girls and shows them an eight-ply rope floating in the water. When she expresses her desire to get it, Asuka asks how a thick rope like that can be beneficial to them. With her practical thinking, Homer explains that they can unply the rope, separating it into individual strands. After assessing the water level, Homer plunges into the water, leaving the girls worried for her return back up. With the rope secured, Homer recalls how her father once taught her about a climbing method called the chimney. Using the chimney method, she uses her back and feet to climb back up. As heavy rain pours down upon the island, the girls seek refuge in their shelter. Asuka reaches her breaking point and goes towards the ocean in search of food. Unfortunately, her ill-fated decision ends up getting her electrocuted. When the lightning continues to flash across the sky, Homer proposes a solution to keep them safe. She suggests finding an object that can serve as a lightning rod. With a clear plan in mind, Homer advises the girls to maintain a distance of 4 meters from the lightning rod and position themselves within a 45-degree angle for optimal safety. Once the sky clears up, Ashuka manages to get herself electrocuted again, this time by jellyfishes. In the vast expanse of the Taklanakan Desert, a young Homer finds herself camping alongside her father, Juchi. 
As they sit together in the barren desert, Juchi introduces her to a unique delicacy known as fox radishes, which thrive in the harsh desert environment. Homer discovers that these radishes not only possess the taste of potatoes but also offer essential nutrients that boost the immune system. In present time, Homer tells Mutsu that she'll be making a knife out of the shears they found earlier. With rabbit droppings, rosin, and ash at her disposal, Homer begins to mix the melted rosin with the ash and rabbit droppings. With the concoction ready, she uses it as glue to piece the knife together. As the day wears on, Asuka complains about a burning sensation on her neck. Matsu quickly identifies the culprit, attributing it to the strong UV rays. The harshness of the sun's rays prompts Shan to imagine herself turning uncomfortably hot and eventually transforming into a crisp mummy. Seven years ago in Fiji, a curious Homer asks Juchi about the possibility of seeing underwater without goggles. To her surprise, Juchi reveals that through proper training, anyone can develop the ability to see clearly underwater. At the present moment, Homer smirks as she navigates the ocean with ease. Moments later, she resurfaces with a squid in hand. Upon Homer's return, Cheyenne asks her if they can somehow create a sunscreen. Homer's mind races to her father's lessons on the harmful effects of UV rays. Juchi also taught her to use the ink produced by squids, as it functions the same as sunscreens. Following Cheyenne and Asuka's loss in a game of rock, paper, scissors to Mutsu, Cheyenne turns to Homer with a request for an alternative method of shielding themselves from the harsh UV rays. Homer then comes up with the idea of utilizing the mucus of seaweed as a makeshift sunscreen. While bringing the pot to Homer, Cheyenne ends up toppling all the seaweed mucus on Homer. Asuka wastes no time and begins rubbing her body against Homer, hoping to absorb the sunscreen. Noticing Cheyenne's frustration at being the only one without sunscreen, Homer swiftly comes to her aid with another creative suggestion. She recommends using dried squid liver, which is known to contain a significant amount of fat and can be used as a makeshift sunscreen. Reminiscing her time in the Botswana swamp, Homer's father advises her to never underestimate the slightest discomfort felt in the wild. So when Mutsu gets stung by a horse flea, Homer gives her the extracts of common dandelion to cure the insect bite. During the construction of a hammock, a sudden gust of wind playfully lifts Asuka's skirt, revealing her bare legs underneath. An unfazed, Homer responds with a thumbs up, stating that there is no shame in doing what's necessary in the wild. As the day unfolds, the girls gather around Homer, expressing her admiration for her knowledge and survival skills. Matsu, filled with gratitude, praises Homer for her guidance and assistance in navigating the challenges of the wild. With a modest smile, Homer credits her ability to thrive in the wilderness to her travels with her father. Fortune smiles upon the girls as they stumble upon a bundle of bamboo sticks washed ashore on the sandy beach. Recognizing the potential of these sticks, Homer suggests using them to construct a sturdy route for their shelter. After creating a makeshift raft-like structure that can be pulled back to the shelter using the rope, Cheyenne and Asuka position themselves atop the bamboo rafts, while Homer and Mutsu take up the task of guiding and pulling the rafts back to their shelter. Arriving at their shelter with a bundle of bamboo sticks, Homer tells Mutsu that they need to shape the bamboo to a more manageable size. For that task, Homer proposes using fire to facilitate the cutting process. With the cutting task completed, the girls step back to admire their handiwork. Upon Shen's unfortunate encounter with a bee sting, Homer proposes to track down the hive responsible for the incident. The girls venture into the forest, where they come across a fallen tree, which the bees have used for their hive. Homer's smile widens as she announces that it's time for some honey. Upon hearing about the potential dangers of bee stings and the risk of shock symptoms, the girls express their reluctance. With a calm and determined demeanor, Homer reminds them that honey is rich in carbohydrates and since they haven't consumed enough carbohydrates, they simply can't miss on such an opportunity. With her strategic mind, Homer formulates a plan to safely collect the honeycomb from the beehive nestled in the fallen log. First, they will create smoke by torching the hollow of the log. The smoke will cause the bees to flee from their hive, and once the bees have been safely lured away, they will carefully enter the log and swiftly collect the honeycomb using a knife. In order to ensure a safe retrieval of the honeycomb, they'll use a relay system. Homer concludes her plan by mentioning the importance of time. As Homer's plan is set into motion, she directs the girls to lie down on the ground, keeping still to avoid provoking the bees. With swiftness, Homer ventures inside the log to collect the honeycombs. When Homer calls for assistance, the girls get cold feet at the sight of bees. Cheyenne notices the bee stings on Homer's body and musters up her courage to help Homer. Witnessing Cheyenne's bravery, Asuka and Matsu push past their fears and come to aid. Their collective bravery and teamwork bears fruit as they successfully obtain the honeycombs. Upon arriving at the shelter, Homer instructs the girls to cut the caps off the comb and use the roof and gutter to collect the honey. As the girls get to work, Cheyenne applies honey on Homer's stings. After relishing the sweetness of the honey, Homer takes Asuka to procure food. As they explore the sandy shoreline, Homer's keen eyes spot a type of fish called soul. She instructs Asuka to search for them in the sand, using an empty bottle as a substitute for goggles. After following Homer's instructions, Asuka catches a soul. Eager to contribute, Cheyenne tells Homer to take her fishing next time. 
The following day, Honer takes on the role of a mentor and guides Shine on her very first fishing mission using the raft. Determined to prove herself, Shine immerses herself in the task. While Shane focuses on her fishing endeavors, Honer takes the opportunity to embark on her own fishing expedition. Soon enough, she manages to catch a black porgy. Upon her return, Honer finds the ocean empty. Her heart begins to sink in worry as she desperately calls out for Shan. The echoes of Homer's desperate call reach the ears of Asuka and Mutsu, snapping them out of their own tasks and drawing them back to the shore. With a heavy heart, Homer tells them the devastating news of Cheyenne getting swept away by the treacherous currents. Overcome by a surge of emotions, Asuka takes hold of Homer's shoulders with a firm grip and asks what she was doing while Cheyenne got swept away. With remorse in her voice, Homer apologizes to her. However, without wasting another minute, Honer asks the girls to assist her in creating a rescue raft. A bittersweet smile plays upon Homer's lips as she apologizes to her father for ignoring his warning to prioritize herself first. With the raft ready, Asuka and Mutsu push Homer gently into the water. As Homer surveys the vast ocean before her, she realizes that the chances of finding Cheyenne are slim to none. Despite her own doubts, Homer assures Mutsu and Asuka that she'll return with Cheyenne. Shaitan finds herself alone adrift in a sea of uncertainty. The weight of her isolation weighs down upon her, and tears begin to well in her eyes. In that moment of despair, she remembers how Homer emphasized the importance of remaining calm in dangerous situations, knowing that humans cannot sustain without water. She reminds herself that panicking will not help her situation. Suddenly, Cheyenne's tearful eyes catch sight of an island in the distance. Determined to find refuge, she steers the raft towards the island. As Matsu and Asuka await the return of Homer and Cheyenne, they try to maintain a semblance of normality in the face of panic and uncertainty. Matsu suggests the idea of steaming the lily bulbs and blanching the sea spinach, anticipating Homer and Shine's hunger upon their arrival. When the facade starts to slip, Asuka assures Matsu that Homer will definitely turn up with Cheyenne. As Cheyenne steps onto the giant rock, a sense of despair washes over her. The barren landscape, devoid of any signs of life, makes her lose all hope. With time running out, Homer finds herself recalling the words of her wise father. Remembering that in survival situations, flexibility is the key, and no matter how challenging the circumstances may seem, there is always a way, a solution waiting to be discovered. Honer takes a leap, both metaphorically and literally, to assess the right distance. As Shin's body grows weaker and her mind begins to cloud with the haze of dehydration, she starts to lose hope. Thoughts of her unique group of friends squirrel in her head. In the midst of her despair, a familiar and comforting voice gives her courage. As Shine opens her eyes, she sees Homer smiling down at her. Confusion fills Shine's mind as she asks Homer about how she managed to find her on this desolate rock. With a calm and determined expression, Homer reminds Shine that no matter the circumstances, there's always a way. Tears glisten in Shine's eyes as she reaches out to embrace Homer tightly. With gentle reassurance, Homer assures Shine that everything is fine now. As Shan expresses her gratitude for having Homer by her side, she eagerly asks for water, expecting Homer to provide some. But to her dismay, Homer reveals that she didn't bring any water with her. Cheyenne's face contorts with disappointment and desperation. Realizing the gravity of the situation, she asks Cheyenne if she noticed anything on the island, hoping for a potential source of water. After racking up her memory, Cheyenne takes Homer to a cave. Homer carefully examines the water on the ground and notices an unpleasant odor emanating from it. She asks Cheyenne to smell it, and upon doing so, Cheyenne immediately recoils in disgust. Homer informs her that the water is rainwater mixed with bat droppings, a combination that poses a high risk of infection if consumed. With guilt and remorse evident in her voice, Shan apologizes to Homer for getting her in the mess. After praising Cheyenne on finding the cave, Homer expresses the need to prepare for their journey back to the shore. Understanding the urgency, Cheyenne joins Homer in collecting necessary materials for the raft. As they gather items, Cheyenne curiously asks Homer about the purpose of the bottles they are gathering. Homer explains that since she was carried away by the current, they can use the reverse current upon their return to aid their navigation. By attaching the bottles to the raft, they can ensure their path remains straight behind them. As the symptoms of dehydration take their toll on Cheyenne and Homer, desperation sets in. Cheyenne, driven by her thirst, reaches for the contaminated water, but Homer intervenes just in time. With a stern voice, Homer explains the consequences of drinking that water, warning Cheyenne that it would only increase their dehydration. She paints a grim picture, mentioning the onset of diarrhea and vomiting, which would further deplete their already limited moisture. Knowing that they still need to replenish their water supply, Homer proposes an unconventional yet crucial solution. She explains that since the colon can absorb water, they can drink from their uses. As Shin contemplates the unconventional method proposed by Homer, Homer assures her that she will take the lead and transfer the water through her mouth. With a calming tone, she encourages Shan to relax and divert her attention to the clouds above. Once Homer completes the process, she asks Shan to reciprocate and assist her in obtaining the much-needed water. With the sun setting, a violated Cheyenne urges Homer to keep the entire ordeal a secret. 
Soon enough, Cheyenne and Homer's hard work pays off as Cheyenne embraces Mutsu and Asuka tightly, expressing her overwhelming relief at being reunited with her friends. The warmth of their embrace fills the air as Homer observes the heartfelt reunion, a smile of contentment gracing her face. The following day, Homer takes charge once again, guiding the girls in their quest to catch a wild boar. As she shares her knowledge and expertise, she mentions the need to rub boar droppings on themselves, as boars possess a keen sense of smell. The mere mention of this prompts Shan to sprint away in protest. Little do they know that their prayers have finally been heard as Juchi is on way to rescue them.